May 27th. Um, I just wanted to re-announce that, that tomorrow we're having a virtual wellness day. Um, and I asked the people to send me a note if they can share with us um, um, some of their insights into this COVID period and, and what it means and how it's going to impact their lives. I think it will be helpful uh, for us all moving forward. So that will be tomorrow uh, at 8. There's no conference Friday. And on Monday, June 1st, we're going to be privileged to have a Zoom conference with Scott Gottlieb, uh, MD, uh, was a resident here at Sinai, was former commissioner of FDA, is uh, extraordinarily well qualified uh, to talk on the current crisis as well as moving forward in many other areas uh, involving drug development, um, device development, uh, and the future health policies uh, of the United States. Today is really um, a mixed day of uh, joy and some degree of sadness because um, Sean Penny is going to be uh, our guest speaker. That's always a uh, <coughs> uh, source of joy. He's a great speaker and his presence at Mount Sinai has been so dominant in the field of cardiology and heart failure. Um, uh, sadness. Uh, I'm going to have to say that he's going to be leaving us uh, in a few days uh, to lead heart failure uh, and help with the development of their heart center at the University of Chicago. Um, he has been so gallant and a tremendous leader in this time of COVID. It really speaks to the person that he is and has been a uh, scholar here at Mount Sinai. Just to tell you a little bit, uh, Sean went to Georgetown Medical School then trained at Beth Israel um, Harvard in Boston, his fellowship in cardiology and heart failure at Columbia, um, and then was recruited here since 2005 to develop uh, a tremendous uh, national level program in heart failure. Um, he has taken Sinai from no place to some place to really a great uh, program. Uh, he was able uh, to attract Donna Mancini to literally uh, a giant field uh, and to have her come here to strengthen the program. And he's mentored such rising stars um, who are uh, really going to be leaders in their own right, uh, Dr. Lala, uh, Dr. Um, Mitter, Dr. Trivieri, uh, Dr. Parikh, uh, Maya Bagash, and Noah Moss, and Fox. Um, so he's left behind a really well-developed program with uh, up and rising stars and current stars, um, but it's really with um, a mixed feeling of uh, goodbye. He had worked in the early days tirelessly, you know, flying around the country um, to retrieve hearts, um, sitting at the bedside of patients, watching um, their every turn of events when they first got the transplant or a new mechanical device. I can't tell you how devoted he is as a physician, um, a clinician, um, he's par excellence. Uh, the fellows all rave about doing rounds with the heart failure and particularly uh, Dr. Penny. But one of the things he's excelled at is really in team building. Uh, to put together a heart a transplant program and a heart failure program really requires great leaders and great minds, which frequently don't work together. And he's been able to coalesce the team to really work to the benefit of the patients and certainly the benefit of the heart center and the benefit of uh, cardiology in general. I don't want to take uh, more time, but I did want to introduce Dr. Valentin Fuster, um, who recruited Sean and knows him well to say a few words, testimonial. Um, there is a more um, uh, formal heart failure meeting, and uh, I did ask several of the heart failure people, but they um, said they're going to have their own uh, meeting. I didn't want to take um, Sean's talk. Dr. Fuster, please. Yeah. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Martin. You know, at anything in life, you have the glasses half empty, half full. You mentioned uh, that the sadness today at Sinai for, for having uh, Sean Pini leaving. Uh, I see the other way around, uh, actually. I think this is a development for somebody who really deserves the best. and. I feel very proud when people move up, uh, as is his case, uh, now moving to Chicago. So I'd like to emphasize the half full rather than the half empty. 
I, I have to go back, you know, um, he has been here, um, Sam has been here for about uh, 15 years now. And I still recall uh, the very beginning, uh, he said, I want to work in advanced heart failure. And now a week later, I actually have my notes here, so I was able to, to go back. A week later, he says, he want, I want to work in pulmonary hypertension. And then a week later, he come back and says, you know, transplantation can be enhanced here at Mount Sinai. I want to work on cardiac transplantation. And it was about a month later, and I have all the dates here. He says, you know, uh, this left ventricular assist device is an interesting thing, and I want to get into it. So I saw his motivation, which is, to me, is critical, very motivated person, comes to see you lots of times, wants to make process and he achieved. I want to, to just don't to say too much because there are so many farewells for him in the next few days. But, but I just like to say one thing. He's a great clinician, a great organizer. And then I have here, actually I had the chance to have the ratings by the, fel the um, house staff. Uh, they always send me the ratings of everybody and I look at, it's unbelievable. Uh, I mean, almost, outstanding on everything from the very beginning. So I have very little to say that to wish you the best. Uh, I want to still stay in the half full and, and we feel very proud. I mean, the next time you come to speak with us, to us will be as a visiting professor. And I think this is a great advance. So uh, congratulations, uh, son, and, uh, and thank you for everything you have done for us. I also, thank you very much, Dr. Fuster. I also asked Dr. Sharma, uh, to say a few words. Dr. Sharma? Sure. Well, all has been said great. I'm so happy uh, for Sean. Uh, he deserves, uh, he finally got what he deserves and will be a co-director of the Heart and Vascular Institute at University of Chicago. And of course, besides just the uh, director of the Heart Failure Service Line and uh, clinical director of uh, research. Clearly, uh, Sean has proven since his arrival here in 2005 as a leader for our cardiovascular institute and Mount Sinai Heart in all aspects and really thankful what he has done to our department and uh, uplifting Mount Sinai Heart presence in uh, both local as well as national international community. And thank you and wish him good and great luck. Thank you very much. Again, there's so much more to say about you, Sean, um, but you do have a talk to give today and I know there's several <laughs> other. So thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us. Um, and as Dr. Fuster said, the next time you'll come back is uh, as a visiting okay. professor, Dr. Sean Penning. Well, well, thank you, Marty. That was a, an incredibly kind and generous introduction. And uh, I'm very, very humbled uh, by your comments. And, and uh, I want to say a, a personal thank you uh, first to Dr. Fuster, who gave me that opportunity 15, 16 years ago to pursue all those interests that I had. Uh, Mount Sinai is such a unique place uh, because of the fact that it has fantastic leadership in Dr. Fuster. So thank you for giving me that, that chance and thank you for, for staking by me over the years and giving me the opportunity to put together a great team. Uh, Dr. Sharma, thank you for uh, allowing me to do left heart casts, which was among the things that I wanted to do when I came here. Uh, thank you for your support over the years. It's really been a fantastic opportunity to work with you uh, with your clinical leadership. Um, I don't know that I'm ever going to find anyone quite like you uh, in terms of your drive, your passion, your talent, and your commitment. And Marty, thank you. Uh, we talked um, many months ago about doing a, a grand rounds uh, to talk about the history of heart failure in general and also here at Mount Sinai. And then COVID hit and it looked like we weren't going to have that opportunity uh, fortunately, the clouds are parting, and there's an opportunity to give one final talk here at Mount Sinai. Um, Sinai has been my family. This is where I've uh, lived, where I've worked. Um, I don't think I'll ever have an opportunity like the one that I had here. So today, I'm very humbled, very grateful, um, and uh, it's a very bittersweet moment. I'm excited for what's to come, uh, but I'm also sad to leave my family. So, Marty, as you said, I, I do have a talk to give. Clearly, I put too many slides in. Uh, but let's um, let's not so much focus on the past. Um, I figured today what I would do is 
um, actually look to the future. And I'm going to talk about something that is another interest of mine, and that is... If you go to the bottom of the screen, share screen, Sean. Yeah. There, is that up now? Yes, now it is. Okay, great. I'm going to talk about device therapies for heart failure because it does touch upon some historic aspects of, of heart failure, but it really sets the stage for where we're going uh, in terms of treating heart failure and also some of the uh, clinical and research opportunities here at Mount Sinai. So let's see. Those are my disclosures. <clears throat> so the, the outline for today's talk, I'm going to uh, just talk very briefly about innovation, talk about two principles that are going to guide the development of new devices for treating heart failure, uh, focus on adverse left ventricular remodeling, which is particularly salient in those patients who have heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, talk about the challenge of excessive increases in left atrial and pulmonary arterial pressures with exercise and how this presents a new therapeutic target, and then wrap up with a few concluding remarks. So this really is an exciting time for those of us who practice heart failure. We've seen a number of innovations just within the last couple of years, starting with the advent of the SGLT2 inhibitors, which are effective not only in patients with diabetes and heart failure, but non-diabetics with heart failure. Uh, Sucubitril valsartan, which goes by the brand name of Entresto, is certainly effective in heart failure reduced ejection fraction. There's some signals to suggest that it may also be effective in some patients with reserved ejection fraction as well. Dr. Mitter is overseeing our amyloid program and can speak uh, eloquently about the advent of certain stabilizers and gene silencers for the treatment of cardiac amyloidosis. And Dr. Stone led the uh, pivotal um, COAP trial looking at transcutaneous mitral valve repair. And then lastly, something that is very near and dear to my heart, that is uh, the advent of a fully magnetically elevated centripetal flow pump. Uh, for using LVADs to treat those patients with advanced heart failure. So in spite of all of those advances, there still is a lot of room for uh, further improvements. So I'm going to talk about two principles and, and, and pos position these as potential therapeutic targets. So the first is the concept that the remodeled left ventricle is a source of ongoing neurohormonal activation and in, is in and of itself a target for therapy. And the second is that we recognize, certainly with patients with heart failure in a preserved ejection fraction, but also in some patients with reduced ejection fraction, that there's an abnormal increase in pulmonary pressures with exercise that limits patient's ability to walk and to, and to exercise. So let's start with talking about the, the pathogenesis of heart failure. And I think it was classified very, very well by uh, Dr. Mark Pfeffer, who said that regardless of the initial mechanism of ventricular um, failure, uh, ventricular failure and dilatation contribute to the self-sustaining process and affect that the adversely remodeled left ventricle becomes an ongoing stimulus for hypertrophy, remodeling, and neurohormonal activation. And this then becomes a promoter in developing the syndrome, not only developing, but sustaining the syndrome of heart failure. Mm -hmm. So it's really rooted in understanding Laplace's law, and Laplace's law states that the wall stress is directly related to the radius of the chamber and is inversely related to the wall thickness. So think about what happens in, in heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. You have this progressive remodeling of the ventricle becoming more and more spherical, as well as relative thinning of the ventricular wall. As a result of that, wall stress goes up significantly, and it's this wall stress that triggers the release of compensatory neurohormones, such as activation of the sympathetic nervous system, and also activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So it would follow then that treatments that have been effective in blocking neurohormones, such as ACE inhibitors and RNA beta blockers as well, should then be reflected in favorable improvements in left ventricular reverse remodeling. So these are data from the SOLVE trial, which were published actually back when I was in medical school. I still remember seeing the New England Journal when, when these came out. But this was a, a sub-study uh, run by uh, Marv Constam and Jim Udelson showing that those patients who were treated with enalapril had a reduction in left ventricular volumes that was sustained during the period of time that they were on the medication. And when enalapril was withdrawn, you began to see adverse remodeling come back. 
Now that's targeting the neurohormones, but what if we were to target the actual source of neurohormonal production, and that is the abnormally enlarged, abnormally remodeled ventricle? And that leads me to this gentleman, Dr. Rondas Batista. So Batista is famous because he's a, a cardiac surgeon in Brazil who's innovated probably seven or eight different surgical techniques. But what he is known for is the operation that bears his name, which is the Batista operation. And sitting there in front of him are a number of surgical specimens. And what those specimens are, are actually resected segments of left ventricular myocardium that he removed as part of the Batista operation. So the idea of the Batista operation is to resect a portion of the viable left ventricle and then reapproximate the edges so that you reshape the ventricle in a more favorable elliptical form as opposed to a global spherical form. And in so doing, you attempt to restore a more normal uh, mass to radius ratio, decreasing wall stress and perhaps improving patients. Now, when Dr. Batista unveiled his operation, he reported unbelievably fabulous results. It certainly got the attention of American surgeons, uh, not the least of which was Dr. Patrick McCarthy, who at the time was at the Cleveland Clinic. And he brought the operation back to the United States and decided to study it. And uh, what he found was that he was not able to reproduce the results that Dr. Batista showed. Um, these are the results looking at uh, partial left ventriculotomy. There were both early failures and late failures of the operation, sometimes quite dramatically so. Uh, but if you look at the impact on survival, there really was no improvement in survival. One year mortality of 20% and a three year mortality rate of 40%. And uh, there are a number of reasons why there was a discrepancy. Um, some of them may have to do with the fact that the hearts that Dr. Batista was operating on were primarily affected by Chagas cardiomyopathy. Uh, there were some other uh, uh, criticisms of his data collection, but nonetheless, this operation has fallen out of favor in the United States. Now, what if you don't resect healthy myocardium, but you do something to remove non-viable remodeled myocardium? And this is the so-called uh, SAVER procedure, surgical ventricular restoration. This is when SAVER meant uh, ventricular restoration and not uh, surgical aortic valve repair. The idea here is to exclude this non-viable area of non-beating myocardium uh, by incising through uh, an apical aneurysm. Um, what a surgeon will then do is encircle the, the um, transition point between viable and non-viable myocardium, approximate the edges as much as possible, and then patch it by therefore excluding this non-viable region. And the end result is a ventricle that has excluded the non-viable portions, reducing LV volumes and restoring a more elliptical shape. Now there, um, Dr. Athanas uh, Suleus, uh, and his colleague, uh, Dr. Jerry Doerr out at UCLA, published some retrospective data that was rather favorable. But we do have some prospective trial data, and this is from the STITCH trial. Uh, one of the strata that were tested in the STITCH trial was whether the addition of surgical ventricular restoration to cabbage would be superior to cabbage alone in patients with uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy and heart failure. And the answer was, uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, this is a five-year outcomes data looking at a combined primary endpoint of death from any cause or hospitalization for cardiac causes. And you can see that there was no difference between the two groups. Um, and I always thought that that was a pretty high bar to achieve, that surgical restoration would result in reductions in mortality. What did surprise me, however, was that it really had no improvement in functional class. For those patients who were treated with cabbage versus cabbage with uh, surgery, uh, surgical ventricular restoration, you can see there was no uh, difference in the uh, functional cl uh, classes between those uh, two groups. So it, maybe it's not a good idea to incise the ventricle, and maybe there's another attempt to reduce adverse remodeling by providing passive constraint. And this was the hypothesis that was tested in the eight Corn core cap. Uh, this is a, uh, a fibrous mesh which is uh, braided and stretchable, and it is sewn onto the heart like a stocking cap. 
So here uh, across the base of the heart between the atria and the ventricle. And the idea is by providing passive restraint, you can reduce wall stress and, and abrogate the remodeling process. Now the initial results of the ACORN trial looked pretty favorable. Um, if you looked at the changes in, in, in diastolic and in systolic volumes, there were greater reductions with the use of the ACORN device versus uh, those patients who uh, were treated with, uh, without it. Um, and there were also imp improvements in the sphericity in, in, uh, index and the non-significant improvement in ejection fraction. But in spite of these favorable uh, changes in ventricular volumes, uh, the device was not approved. And one of the reasons why was because there were concerns about safety, uh, particularly for those patients who needed reoperation, that there was a lot of adhesions that were formed by the device. There was a concern that the patients who had received the device would not be eligible for subsequent uh, coronary artery bypass grafting, should that be required. And lastly, there were data that were shared with the FDA that were not publicly uh, reported that uh, probably showed increased risk of harm uh, with the implantation surgery, but the end result was that the device was not approved. So maybe uh, it may be beneficial to move out of the surgical sphere and into the device sphere. And uh, this was a, a unique device called the Parachute. Um, this was designed by a company called CardioKinetics. Essentially what this is, it's a, a PTFT, PTFE skirt, which is suspended on a uh, expanding, self-expanding night and all frame. And, and to me, it really looks like an inverted drink umbrella. That's the way I've always thought about it. But this device can be collapsed. It can be threaded through a catheter and can be delivered to the left ventricular apex. And the idea is that by putting in the parachute device, what you end up doing is you exclude a large area of aneurysmal left ventricle, you reduce left ventricular volumes, and you provide a more favorable geometry. Uh, this restoring effect was the primary hypothesis as to why this device might work, but there was also a second hypothesis, which is that the presence of the device actually would have a trampoline-like effect whereby blood coming in through the mitral valve from the left atrium hits the device, it absorbs that kinetic energy, and then the night and off frame recoils, um, propelling the blood forward out the aorta, much like a trampoline. Now this was um, uh, a very interesting device, as I said, here is a picture of a device in situ. Uh, this is a left ventricular gram, and you can get the sense that the, the ventricle is a little bit more like a protease elliptoid. This is a CT scan, and you can kind of appreciate the excluded areas uh, that were excluded by the, uh, the parachute device, providing a, a smaller ventricular geometry. Um, in early clinical studies, there was uh, an early and sustained reduction out to about two months in both uh, diastolic and end systolic volumes. Um, by three years, however, there was uh, ongoing reverse remodeling, and uh, there was no longer a statistical difference between um, the control and the, uh, and, the, and the therapeutic arm. This is also <clears throat> reflected in some favorable improvements in functional capacity and also quality of life. Uh, however, the trial, the pivotal parachute trial was terminated early uh, because of uh, two reasons. One was that there did not seem to be any reduction in mortality. So it was likely that the device was going to miss its primary endpoint. And second, out of concerns of safety, there was an uh, increased uh, frequency of type 2 myocardial infarction, TIAs, and strokes in those patients who received the device as compared to control. So this device is no longer being tested. As I mentioned before, some of the exciting news what we saw was the, um, the use of uh, a mitral clip, a percutaneous mitral valve repair to reduce left ventricular volumes to uh, improve symptoms of heart failure. But it extended a, a debate that was being held on the surgical side, which is, could you treat a ventricular disease at the level of the leaflets, whether that by, be by surgical repair or by percutaneous repair? Uh, these are the results that were presented, uh, I guess, about two and a half years ago now by Dr. Stone uh, at TC, TCT, showing that uh, Mitra clip was very effective in reducing hospitalizations for heart failure out over a two-year follow-up period. 
But what effect did MitraClip have on ventricular volumes? What happened when you removed that uh, regurgitant volume? Um, in the control arm, we could see that following um, the procedure, you could see that there was ongoing adverse remodeling. The ventricular bonds continued to uh, increase. However, for those patients who were treated with MitraClip, there were early reductions in left ventricular end diastolic volume that were no longer apparent by one year. And by two years, those ventricles had continued to remodel. And just rem remember that in patients who were enrolled in COAPT as opposed to MitraFR, their ventricular volumes were not as large uh, in COAPT as compared to Mitra FR. But even in these quote unquote smaller ventricles, ongoing left ventricular remodeling continues. So maybe what we need to do is to again focus not so much at the mitral valve, but at the remodeled ventricle itself. And so this was an interesting device. It was the Coapsis device by a company called Myocor. And the idea behind this device was to uh, physically restrain the ventricle by this flexible cord that was positioned between an anterior pad, which was uh, positioned in the anterior LV, just, um, just lateral to the RV insertion point and away from the LAD, and a posterior pad, which was positioned just behind the posterior mitral valve leaflet. The idea behind this device was that it would achieve two things. One, it would provide passive restraint preventing the adverse remodeling that, uh, that takes place in heart failure. And the second thing is that by buttressing the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve, it would also reduce the amount and severity of functional mitral regurgitation. So this was tested in the Restore MV trial. Uh, patients were randomized to uh, mitral, uh, to uh, coronary artery bypass grafting uh, with or without mitral valve repair versus cabbage with the use of the coapsis device. Um, this trial was stopped early, uh, not because of a failure of uh, safety or efficacy, but because the company ran out of money. So this trial was taking place during the Great Recession, and when that hit, the company ran out of money and uh, was no longer able to sustain the trial. However, if you look at those patients in green who were treated with the coapsis device versus those who were treated in blue, you can see that there was a signal there that the device was certainly non-inferior to cabbage with mitral valve repair and may have even been superior to, uh, to uh, mitral valve repair alone. So there, although there was a lot of interest in focusing and reducing functional mitral regurgitation, the idea now is to focus not so much on the leaflets, but again on the remodeled ventricle. And this leads us to the AccuSense device. Um, and this is a device that we are currently trialing here at Mount Sinai. Dr. Vivek Reddy is the, the PI, and I believe he's uh, done this procedure. <coughs> if he's not here, he certainly performed it in Prague. The way that this device works is it, it consists of a series of these ringlet anchors, a cable, and sliders uh, that uh, serve as spacers between the different anchors. So percutaneously, what you can see here is a catheter delivering the, the rail. And each one of these anchors is positioned into the LV endocardium. And once they are in position, the device is cinched or pulled tight. And what that effectively does is it pulls the ventricle together and it also closes the mitral valve a little bit. So as I mentioned before, the target for this is not the mitral valve itself, it's actually the uh, remodeled heart. And so the device is positioned about one quarter to a third of the way, uh, directed apically from the uh, mitral valve, and it is slung uh, behind the papillary muscles. And when it is cinched, it shrinks ventricular volumes. So these were some preliminary data also presented at TCT by Dr. Dan Burkhoff. Again, just an early feasibility study looking at a handful of patients showing that there were uh, significant and sustained reductions in mitral regurgitation grade uh, out through six months. There were also um, early and sustained reductions in left ventricular and systolic volumes through, uh, out through six months as well. And what's really exciting about this device is uh, not so much what occurs in the short term, but what occurs in follow-up. So here's what happens at implant. Here's the original device 
And when it is cinched, you can see that the ventricle um, gets shortened by, in this particular example, about 11 millimeters when the device is cinched. And as that happens, you can see here, this is left ventricular in diastolic volume. This is left ventricular, I'm sorry, in diastolic and in systolic volumes. And as the device is cinched, there are reductions in both of these volumes. And the reductions in volume, uh, excuse me, reduction in diameter is essentially unchanged out through about three months. But let's look what happens remote from this area and look at left ventricular volumes. So here is baseline left ventricular in diastolic volume. This is the volume after the device is cinched. But in three months of follow-up, there are um, ongoing further reverse remodeling effects with uh, ongoing reductions in ventricular volume, suggesting that it's not just the mechanical cinching of the ventricle, but there is some biological process that leads to reverse remodeling over time. And this is uh, just shown graphically here. These are superimposed three-dimensional CT scans at uh, baseline is in uh, red or magenta, and at uh, three-month follow-up is in blue, and you can kind of get a sense of the fact that there has been a significant reduction in the volume of these ventricles over time. So as I mentioned, this uh, device is in clinical trials here, and uh, we're looking forward to enrolling uh, a number of patients. So one last device I want to talk about uh, before moving on to the next principle is the BioVentrix device. And I bring this up because we are also going to be clinically trialing this here. This is a collaboration between the cath lab with Dr. Sharma and CT surgery with Dr. Anyanwo. Dr. Anyanwo, this device requires that collaboration in an, either an interventional suite or in the operating room. And it requires two operators. The first is the interventional cardiologist who gains uh, access into the venous system and into the right side of the heart and brings down an anchor. And then the cardiac surgeon who uh, uh, punctures the left ventricle and threads a needle across the interventricular septum into the right ventricle. Uh, that uh, is then snared and pulled through, giving a, uh, a guide wire between the LV and the RV. And what uh, this device accomplishes is a reduction in ventricular volumes through left ventricular application. So as this device is positioned, you can see there's an anchor here that gets approximated to the right side of the interventricular septum. And then coming in from the left side, the surgeon will cinch down, compressing the, the infarcted lateral wall against the interventricular septum. And in so doing, placating the ventricle and restoring a not only smaller uh, ventricular volume, but also a more favorable ventricular shape. So this device, as I said, is going to be in clinical trials here. I first saw this about two years ago uh, at ICI in, in Tel Aviv, and uh, there were two cases that were performed in China. And I was like, you know, that's so crazy, it just might work. So unfortunately, I won't be here to, to see the, uh, the patients uh, recruited and enrolled, but uh, I do wish Dr. Anianwu and Dr. Sharma success with this trial. Okay, so let me move on to the, to the second uh, concept, which is that um, for patients who have heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, um, one of the hallmarks is the fact that when they're sitting in front of you, they're comfortable, they're at rest, the resting hemodynamics are really not that bad, but they have this complaint of intractable shortness of breath with exertion. So these are data from Dr. Barry Borlaug and, and Dr. Maggie Redfield at the Mayo Clinic, who uh, screened these patients and did exercise hemodynamics showing that at baseline in red, those patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction have pretty reasonable uh, left atrial filling pressures, but with a little bit of volume increase that, for example, what you get with a leg lift, uh, you see early increases in uh, left atrial pressure. With low level and with peak exercise, you have significant increases in uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure up to the 30 to 40 millimeter of mercury mark. And once the heart rate comes down with rest, the filling pressures also come down. Now, I think this is one of the reasons why both HEFPEF and HEFREF patients have exertional limitation, because you can see that there is an inverse correlation between your increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure 
and your ability to increase your peak oxygen consumption, such that those patients who have heart failure, preserved ejection fraction with exercise, have very, very high pulmonary capillary wedge pressures and a very, very low uh, achieved peak oxygen consumption. So if we can find a way to decrease left atrial pressure and decrease pulmonary arterial pressure with exercise, that should translate into significant improvements in functional capacity. So a, an original observation was uh, the so-called Lutenbache's uh, phenomenon. Uh, Lutenbache describes those patients who had rheumatic aortic, um, excuse me, rheumatic mitral stenosis, but had a, a persistent atrial septal defect. Those patients experienced fewer symptoms and had better outcomes compared to those patients who had pure mitral stenosis alone. And that closure of an ASD can trigger a rise in pulmonary artery pressure and cause pulmonary edema. So maybe if you have a closed um, interatrial septum, maybe the thing to do is to open it up. Take a high pressure chamber with exercise, the left atrium, um, open up the interatrial septum, let it serve as a pop-off valve and, and allow blood flow to shunt over into the lower um, pressure, higher compliant uh, right-sided circulation. And so um, this opened up the, uh, a lot of enthusiastic research into interatrial shunt devices. And so this is computer modeling, which asks the question, attempts to answer the question, how big does the hole need to be? Uh, obviously, if you have a pressure gradient between the LA and the RA, and you have a very, very small hole, you're not going to be able to shunt very much blood. On the other hand, you don't want a huge gaping hole because there's a theoretical risk of paradoxical embolism and stroke. So where is the um, diameter optimized? And it seems to be somewhere around eight millimeters of mercury where you get pretty close equalization of pressures. And this is shown here in the no shunt and the shunting modeling. So <clears throat> the concept is that by putting in place an interatrial shunt device, the elevated left ventricular pressures that one sees with exercise can be blocked. Um, by um, shunting the blood from the left atrium to the right atrium, therefore reducing pulmonary venous hypertension and uh, improving exercise performance. So this was uh, tested in an initial um, safety and feasibility study. This is the Reduce LAP Heart Failure Randomized Trial by Corvia Medical. This is their interatrial septal device. You can see it's essentially it's a stellate shaped uh, night and all frame that is positioned across the interatrial septum. It has an eight millimeter internal diameter and a 19 millimeter external diameter and it's delivered uh, by a, uh, a percutaneous catheter. Um, the trial enrolled uh, 66 patients. Um, it was primarily a, a safety and efficacy trial looking at the ability to deliver device effectively with a low incidence of major adverse cardiac and cerebrovascular events. And to be eligible for this trial, you had to have symptomatic heart failure, you had to be over than, older than 40 years old, and you had to have heart failure preserved ejection uh, fraction with an EF of greater than or equal to 40%. There were some hemodynamic criteria too. You needed to have an elevated wedge pressure either at rest or with exercise, and you had to have a low or uh, a central venous pressure that was at least lower than your left atrial pressure. And there were some key exclusion criteria. You couldn't be too sick. You couldn't have low output. You, couldn't, you had to be able to perform a six-minute walk test. And you could not have had a history of previous TIA or embolic events. So looking at one month, uh, we can see that the device had some beneficial effects on hemodynamics. These are the control arm who did not receive the device, you can see that uh, at baseline in one month with leg lift, uh, low level and, and peak exercise, there was uh, no difference in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure between those two time points. However, for those patients who received the interatrial septal device, um, there were significant reductions in left atrial pressure with leg raise, with low level exercise, and with peak exercise. And this is one month after uh, the device was implanted. <clears throat> Looking at safety, uh, the device um, was very safe. There were no significant um, uh, adverse events with device implantation at, and at six months. 
At one year, there was one patient who had a stroke out of 64, um, but otherwise there were no other uh, paradoxical or systemic embolic events. Um, importantly, the shunt remained open both at six months and at one year, and there was no evidence of right to left shunting, so the patients were not uh, 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 cyanotic or desaturated. And the amount of shunt was not that big. You're talking about a, a 1.3 uh, to 1 uh, left to right shunt, so not that, not that large of a shunt. And this is looking at some of the uh, clinical effectiveness. There were significant uh, and uh, sustained increases in New York Heart Association functional class. There are improvements in uh, heart failure-related quality of life, and there were also improvements in the six-minute walk distance. And looking out over one year, looking at the effects of hemodynamics, um, Importantly, it's, it's, it's important to point out that there's no evidence of right ventricular failure. The right atrial pressure was the same one year out. The uh, pulmonary arterial pressure, the mean PA pressure was the same. Uh, important to show that it did not create pulmonary hypertension by creating a small left to right shunt. The wedge pressure was not that much different. However, there were significant improvements in cardiac output that were recognized at six months and at one year. And uh, importantly, exercise hemodynamics out to one year also improved in terms of the amount of exercise time, the amount of workload achieved, and this coincides with a, a stable reduction in wedge pressure and an increase in cardiac output. And if you sum the two together and look at work-indexed pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, there was a significant reduction in the amount of uh, wedge pressure in, that, was, uh, that was realized with higher grades of exercise. So overall, pointing to the fact that implantation of the device was safe, it was effective, and it resulted in early and sustained clinical benefit. Okay. So this device has now been in clinical trials for a number of years. We've been in a rolling center, and we've really struggled to get patients into this trial. Um, it's not for a lack of trying, but it's a lack of uh, being able to identify the right patient who meets all the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Now, this is not the only device in, in this space. In fact, there are several other devices. There are a number of companies who are very excited about this uh, therapeutic target. The other one that's worth mentioning is the uh, so-called V-Wave, and this is a, uh, being tested right now. It's being trialed right now in the Relieve Heart Failure trial. Now, this device differs in a couple different ways from the Corvia interatrial uh, uh, shunt device in the fact that you can see the shape is much different. This is, has a uh, conical shape, and it's thought that this creates a venturi effect that facilitates sucking blood from the left atrium into the right atrium. The second thing is that the aperture here is a little bit smaller. This is a five millimeter um, internal diameter as compared to the Corvia device, which was eight millimeters. And the other thing that's important to point out is in the first iteration of this device, it had a membrane here that created a one-way valve that allowed blood to flow left to right, but would prevent blood from flowing right to left. In the subsequent iterations of the device, that was taken out, in part because of the favorable um, results from the Corvia trial, but also because um, that, um, that uh, membrane fused and six months after implantation, there was no left to right shunting. So that has been taken out, and uh, this is the device as it uh, currently exists in clinical trials. <clears throat> now, one thing that's really important to point out, I, I showed this with the, the Corvia data, that the shunts are not that big. Uh, you know, 1.2, 1.3 to 1 uh, Q, uh, QPQS is, is not that significant, but, but that's okay because of the fact that the ventricles, whether it's a heart failure preserved or heart failure reduced ejection fraction, we know that small changes in volume in these patients result in significant changes in pressure. So you don't have to shunt that much blood in order to keep the left atrial pressure lower and to improve uh, exercise capacity. So um, the first in human trial uh, looked at about 40 patients, 38 patients, high procedural success very safe. There was only one patient who required a pericardiocentesis, 
there were some deaths in um, within one year, and none of those were device related. The device was associated with improvements in functional class, improvements in quality of life, and improvements in six minute walk distance. And as I mentioned before, the Relieve HF trial is underway. We'll be an enrolling site, and uh, the device and the trial are clearly in good hands because among the executive steering committee is our own Dr. Greg Stone, who has been active with, uh, with this protocol now for, for quite some time. So let me wrap up with one other interesting intervention. And, and while the intraatrial shunt devices decrease left atrial pressure by creating a pop-off valve, um, there is also a, a way to drop pressure by increasing venous capacitance and decreasing the amount of blood return to the heart. So one of the, the large reservoirs in our, our bodies for, for blood is in the splanchnic circulation, in the intestines, in the spleen, and in the liver. And with symptomatic, symptomatic with, um, with uh, increases in sympathetic tone and sympathetic activation, you have shunting away from the abdominal viscera into the central space. Now, every one of us has felt that, that so-called pit in your stomach when you get nervous or if you're on a roller coaster. That is physiologically what you feel when you have increased sympathetic tone and shunting of blood out of the splanchnic circulation into the central circulation. And it's thought that uh, up to about a half a liter or 500 cc's of blood can be shunted immediately out of one circulation into the other. So what if we could reverse that? What if we could block sympathetic activation to the splanchnic circulation, increase venous capacitance, and decrease central congestion? So this was tested by delivering a greater splanchnic nerve block so this actually has been done uh, for control of abdominal pain, uh, particularly in patients with uh, metastatic cancer. You can inject lidocaine uh, into the greater splanchnic nerve. Not only does that block the pain fibers, but it also blocks the sympathetic fibers. So um, if you're wondering, I've never heard of the greater sympathetic nerve, where is it? This is the sympathetic trunk and the greater uh, splanchnic nerve is constituted coming off of branches around T6, T7. And this can be a target not only for a nerve block, but also other interventional approaches to uh, ablate the greater splanchnic nerve. Now, this is uh, just a, a proof of principle. This was delivering lidocaine as a nerve block and then doing invasive hemodynamic measurements. Five patients all showing reductions in pulmonary arterial mean pressure, reductions in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, uh, as well as decreases in SVR uh, without a significant change in cardiac index. So showing at least in principle that blocking that greater splanchnic nerve may result in venous, uh, uh, venodilation and an increase in venous capacitance. Um, this will be a target of therapy. There are uh, surgical attempts to do this. There are also device catheter-based attempts to achieve this uh, greater splanchnic nerve blocking. Um, so keep an eye out for those. Um, there are currently some trials that are uh, just initial proof of principle and first in human, but uh, this is a, a pretty exciting therapeutic avenue. <clears throat> so uh, in conclusion, uh, I can say that device therapy for heart failure is evolving. Uh, we're targeting ventricular remodeling, and I think there's a lot of promise in targeting the remodeled ventricle. Uh, interatrial shunt devices do effectively reduce pressure and increase exercise capacity. Um, these interatrial shunt devices should benefit both patients with reduced as well as preserved ejection fraction. And, and I have to say, just as a, a commentary, as exciting as these devices are and, and as exciting to think about the promise that they hold, I do think that one has to recognize that on an individual level, these devices are very uh, beneficial, but very hard to translate this to population level therapy. So I, I don't ever want to give a talk on heart failure without talking about the need to initiate an advanced guideline directed medical therapy. So again, let me, let me thank uh, Marty, let me thank you, let me thank Dr. Sharma, Dr. Fuster, and in particular, very, very heartfelt Thank you to my colleagues and my teammates who have allowed me to do this work, uh, who have made me a very lucky man, a very happy man over the last 16 years.
So let me uh, pause there and hopefully I left uh, a few minutes for questions if there are any. Thank you. Um, that was really a fantastic tour de force. Um, and uh, again, uh, we need talks like that on a periodic basis. So we'll have you come back, but you're leaving behind really a tremendous legacy of what you created here at Sinai. Um, if I can just uh, have the first question, um, you didn't talk at all, which was interesting by its absence about stem cell therapy, which had a few years ago been really a hot topic and uh, we haven't heard much about it. Um, what's your thoughts? Is there any potential uh, for directed therapy along those lines, mesenchymal cells, stem cells, um, either given at the time of uh, heart surgery, through a catheter? Um, what's your thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question, Marty. I think there was a, a lot of enthusiasm around stem cells when I first came here to Mount Sinai. Um, there was a, a lot of uh, active investigation um, in a number of centers uh, at Hopkins, at Michigan, at Harvard, uh, now ongoing still down at Miami and at uh, Cedars, uh, Cedar sinai um, I think we can say a couple things about stem cell therapy. The first is that uh, I don't think it's ever going to, one is not going to be able to regrow, if you will, enough mass of myocardium. Uh, to be a viable therapy for heart failure. So its benefits, if any, are, are not from regrowing the heart, uh, which was certainly the way that it was initially uh, conceived. There are some, um, some studies, particularly cardiospheres, that uh, Dr. Marban has been looking at at uh, Cedar sinai that have shown some promise. There have been some increases in ejection fraction, but I think most uh, in the field gravitate to the idea that it's not because of an increase in muscle mass, but rather it's due to certain paracrine effects, uh, perhaps reductions in inflammatory markers, uh, as well as reductions in, in neurohormones. And in fact, it's, it's a reduction in inflammatory markers that um, led to the use of mesenchymal cells in treating COVID. And so many um, on the call know that Mount Sinai was one of the institutions that was testing the use of mesenchymal stromal cells in patients with severe uh, respiratory failure who were intubated as a result of COVID. Clearly, we're very interested in seeing the results of that, but I think what we can say is that these cells have more of an effect on a, a paracrine effect, uh, changing the inflammatory milieu and, and creating a more favorable neurohormonal environment. Thank you, Sean. Uh, one additional question. So, you gave a list of uh, potential mechanical therapies. Can you give us sort of an algorithm, whether you're using imaging, how to personalize which of those devices would be ideal to use first and foremost in the patient therapy? Um, I think that's a critical question, Marty. You know, as there has been a significant explosion in, in both pharmacologic and device-based therapies, um, we will have to come up with algorithms to, in a sense, comparatively uh, compare the effectiveness across these different platforms. No such comparative efficacy trials currently exist. Um, but I think that um, for patients who have particular subtypes of heart failure, so you had someone who had uh, an ischemic cardiomyopathy with a large area of akinesis or a dyskinetic ventricle, those would be ones where it would make a lot of sense to, to target uh, ventricular reduction, uh, perhaps through um, one of the, the percutaneous devices that are under clinical trials. Um, I think the interatrial shunt devices offer a, a terrific option for patients who probably are not very good surgical candidates and who are primarily looking to do something at relatively low risk with the reward being an increase in functional capacity. And I think that might be someone who's a little bit older. Um, a number of my patients, um, particularly those who are more advanced in age, are, are particularly looking for that. They're, they're not looking to live to be 100, but they're looking for uh, therapies that can be delivered to improve their quality of life. So I think when, it, when I boil it all down, I think the, the devices that I'm most excited about are the interatrial shunt devices. I think they're the ones that have the most potential and are probably going to be able to be more uh, distributed in a, in a more widespread way. Thank you. And Dr. Fuster, any comments? 
Well, my, my comment has to do with a historical background, and that is, we all talk about pharmacology, biological uh, manipulations, and so forth. But when one goes back and one sees in the 1950s uh, the, the the bypass uh, and, and machines that led to open heart surgery, and then you move into the epoch, the, the times of uh, Grunsik, and you see that mechanical opening of the arteries, and then you come back to assist devices and ECMOs, and now with the presentation that you that you just heard, you cannot get out from saying that mechanical approaches to cardiovascular disease have had a tremendous impact. And although those of us who have been struggling with the biology and with pharmacology and so forth have to accept the fact that a lot has been gained in terms of better health and, and prolongation of life by mechanical approaches. And that the, the, what you heard today, I think is a clear example that why we cannot get away from it. And that's what it is. Thank you. Any additional questions um, from the listening audience? We had almost 100 people listening, Sean. Really a credit um, to their love for you as well as interest in the topic. Any uh, additional questions? Hi, Dr. Goldman. This is Gennaro. I have a question for Dr. Pini. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Just yes. yes, thanks, Gennaro. Dr. Pini, thank you so much for this uh, talk. And uh, just I wanted to say a word from uh, me from a house staff perspective since I was an intern when I ran it with you for the first time. And uh, I think it's been amazing working with you and we all learn so much the way that you approach problems and you dissect problems and uh, you take care of patients. So thank you so much for all uh, for your uh, teaching. So my question is for uh, an area that I think that I seem that is growing and may be very interesting is the one of uh, percutaneous durable wireless LVADs. What thoughts do you have about those devices? I know they are like very preliminary in the pipeline, but do you think there are going to be any future? Is going to be an intersection between interventional and surgery? What are your thoughts about those devices? Yeah, and 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 well, first of all, Jenna, thank you for for those very kind comments. Um, there is no greater happiness than to be able to work with uh, residents and fellows. And uh, I am very passionate about teaching. And uh, one of the, the greatest honors that, that I've received was receiving the Simon Dack Award. Uh, that is a plaque that uh, I, I always had next to me on, on my wall in my office and it will certainly be prominently displayed uh, right next to my Cardinal's paraphernalia in my Chicago office. Uh, but thank you for, for saying that. Um, the percutaneous uh, assist devices I clearly gravitated away from speaking about because uh, they're a whole lecture into, uh, unto themselves. There are miniaturized uh, continuous flow pumps that we will be working uh, and studying here. Uh, Dr. Soreo has uh, been working with uh, Prosterion to use one of these continuous flow pumps to, if you will, pressurize the, the renal artery and uh, use it as a, a therapeutic intervention for patients with heart failure and cardiorenal syndrome, something that's very, very exciting. A related device is the um, second heart. Uh, I don't know why they call it second heart, I guess because our own heart is the first heart, but um, it's second heart, which is exactly what you're discussing. It is a percutaneously delivered axial flow pump that um, can be disarticulated from the, the catheter and from the, uh, the drive line. And a patient can wear a belt that will transcutaneously power and control the device. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, the data are, are, are non-existent yet. Um, I think they have some animal data. Um, but the promise is uh, very exciting. The idea of being able to implant a um, completely implantable axial flow pump to augment cardiac output to serve as a true assist device rather than a replacement device and do so in a way that doesn't require a, a transcutaneous uh, drive line is very exciting. So at least at this point in time, all I can say is uh, I'm excited about it, but uh, Still has a long way to go to prove its metal. Thank you. Thank you, Janara. Any additional uh, questions? Um, I would just encourage uh, 
people to send uh, notes to Sean. I hope mm. here just a couple of more days, uh, but can personally express your appreciation for everything he's done uh, for our patients and for the institution. Um, again, we'll have him back in the near future, certainly. Um, he's all confused, but we know he's really a Yankee uh, <laughs> and at heart. Uh, after all, um, Sean, thank you so much uh, for a really superb talk and for everything you've done for us. Um, have a great day. And many other ceremonies, virtual and potentially live, that will occur in the next few days and certainly in the near future. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, everybody.